Dark Cast Network. Out of the shadows comes the best of indie podcasts. The Amityville Horror is a book by American author J. Anson, published in September 1977. It is also the basis of a film series released since 1979. The book is based on the claims of the paranormal experiences by the Lutz family, but has since led to some controversy and lawsuits over its truthfulness. My name is DJ, and this is the Mythical True Crime Podcast. Hello and welcome to tonight's show. If you're new to this channel, welcome. My name is DJ and I recount stories that deal with some paranormal or supernatural element in otherwise true crime cases. I'm part of the Darkcast network of indie podcasters. I tend to publish regularly about every couple weeks or so, however long it takes me to get research done. I am a one person crew and I love what I do. And if you do enjoy tonight's story, drop me a line. Find me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You could also consider supporting the show monetarily, either by clicking my Patreon link or by clicking the Buzzsprout supporter link in the description. All right, so now just sit back and enjoy tonight's episode. Now, some historical basis off the Amityville Horror uh, on November 13th, 1974, a man named Ronald Defoe Jr. shot and killed six members of his family on 112 Ocean Avenue, a large Dutch colonial house situated in the suburb neighborhood of Amityville, which is what the story is based on. Now, that's on the south shore of the Long Island, New York. He was convicted of second-degree murder in November 1975, and was sentenced to six terms of 25 years to life in prison. Now, a little bit about him. He died in custody on March 2021. In December 1975, the story uh, that takes place is that of George and Kathleen, Kathy Lutz, uh, and their three children who move into the house. Now, they only spent about 28 days inside before the Lutz fled the house, claiming that they had been terrorized by paranormal phenomenon while living there. Now, the book was written after a man named Tam Mosen, an editor at the publishing house Prince, uh, Prentice Hall, introduced George and Kathleen Lutz to Jay Anson, the writer of the book. Uh, the Lutzes did not work directly with Anson, but they did submit around 45 hours of video, uh, tape-recorded recollections to him, uh, which were used as the basis for the book. Now, estimates of the sales of this book are around 10 million copies from numerous edita uh, editions. Uh, Anson is said to have been based the title on uh, the Amityville Horror on Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft, which was published back in 1929. Now, the main plot of the book, it describes the house at 112 Ocean Avenue uh, as remaining empty for about 13 months after the Defoe murders. In December 1975, uh, George and Kathleen Lutz bought the house uh, for what was considered to be a bargain price of about $80,000. Now, the five-bedroom house was built in a Dunwich, uh, sorry, a Dutch colonial style, and uh, it had a distinctive uh, gramble roof, um, which you all see from the movie posters and also the book. Uh, it had a swimming pool, a boathouse. It was also located near the canal. Now, George and Kathy uh, married at that July 1975, and each had their own homes, but they wanted to start a fresh uh, start with this new property. Kathy already had three children from her previous marriage. Uh, Daniel, who was nine, Christopher, who was seven, and Melissa, who went by Missy. Uh, she was the age of five. Now, they also owned a crossbreed uh, Labrador dog named Harry. Now, during their first inspection of the house, a real estate broker told them that uh, a little bit about the Defoe murders and asked if that would have affected their uh, decision. After discussing the matter together, they decided that it wasn't going to really be a problem. 
Now, the Lutz family moved in on December 18th, uh, 1975. Much of the Defoe family's furniture was actually still inside the house. Uh, that was also included for about $400 as part of that deal that they made with the broker. Now, a friend of George uh, Lutz learned that the history of the house and insisted that they should have it blessed. Now, at this time, George was a non-practicing Methodist and had no experience in what that would entail. Kathy was a non-practicing Catholic um, and explained the process. George said he, that he knew a Catholic priest named uh, Father Ray who agreed to carry out the house blessing. Now, in the book, the real-life priest's uh, name was Father Ralph uh, Percario and is referred to as uh, Father Macuso for privacy reasons. Now, Father Macuso was a lawyer, a judge of the Catholic court, and a psychotherapist who lived in the local Sacred Heart Rectory. He arrived to perform the blessing while George and Kathy were unpacking their belongings on that afternoon, uh, December 18th, 1975. Now, he went into uh, the building to carry out the rites, and when he was licking his first holy water and began to pray, he said that he heard a masculine voice demand the famous lines, Get out. When leaving the house, Father Macuso didn't mention this incident to either George or Kathy. Uh, later, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, several days later, uh, Father Macuso said that he called George to advise him to stay out of the second floor room uh, where he had heard the mysterious voice. I guess he plumb forgot. The former bedroom uh, of Mark and John Matthew Defoe, and that's where he said he heard the voice, Kathy planned to use it as a sewing room, but the call was cut short by static. Following his visit to the house, uh, Father Macuso allegedly developed a high fever and blisters on his hands, similar to that of stigmata. At first, George and Kathy experienced nothing unusual in the house. Talking about their experiences subsequently, though, they reported as if they were, quote, living with each other in different houses. Now, by mid-January 1976, uh, after another attempt of a house blessing by George and Kathy, they experienced what would have turned out to be their final night in the house. The Lutzes declined to give the full account of the events that took place on this occasion, describing them as, quote, too frightening. After getting in touch with Father Macuso, the Lutzes decided to take some of their belongings and stay at Kathy's mother's house, which was nearby uh, Deer Park in New York, until they had sorted out their problems with the house. They claimed that the phenomenon followed them there, and that the final scene in Anson's book, describing, quote, greenish-black slime coming up the staircase towards them. On January 14th, 1976, George and Kathy Lutz and their three children and their dog Harry officially left 112 Ocean Avenue, leaving all of their possessions behind. The next day, a mover arrived to remove the possessions and send them to the Lutzes. However, he reported no paranormal phenomenon while inside the house. Now, at this time, I should mention that there were other books written uh, about this account. The story uh, Amityville Horror was continued in a series of books by author John G. Jones uh, with the Amityville Horror Part 2, which came out in 1982, uh, the final chapter in 1985, and also The Evil Escapes in 1988, uh, with the final The Horror Returns in 1989. In 1991... Amityville, The Nightmare Continues, was written by Robin Carl. Hans Holzer wrote three books relating to the story, Murder in Amityville, The Amityville Curse, and The Secret of Amityville Murder. Murder in Amityville was used as the basis for the 1982 film Amityville II, The Possession, and the 1990 film uh, Amityville Curse was based on the book of the same name. Now, William Weber, the defense attorney for Ronald Defoe Jr. at his trial, recommended that the Halzer book to Defoe uh, in 1979 as a way for Defoe to obtain a book deal telling his side of the story. And in 1983, Amityville 3D was also turned into a novelization by Gordon McGill. Mentally ill in Amityville 
was a factual account of the case by Wilm Saviv, uh, and it was published in 2008. Now, there are some disputes over the accuracy. Uh, for example, the role of Father Picario, which was uh, Father Mancuso in the book, uh, in the story was given considerable attention. During the course of the lawsuit that actually surrounded the case in the late 70s, uh, Father Picario stated that in an affidavit that he was only uh, contacted by the Letts concerning the matter that had been over the telephone. Other accounts say that Father Picario uh, did visit the house, but experienced nothing unusual there. In 1979, Father Picario uh, appeared in silhouette and described his experience while blessing the Amityville house during an interview for the television series In Search Of. Now, in the interview, Picario makes it clear that he did, in fact, enter the home and that he was slapped by an invisible force and was told to get out by a disembodied voice. The claims of physical damage into the locks, doors, and windows were rejected by Jim and Barbara Cromarty, uh, who bought the house for $55,000 in March 1977. Barbara Cromarty uh, argued that they appeared to be the original items and they have not been repaired. The Cromartys also revealed that the red room uh, was a small closet in the basement, and it would have been known by the previous owners of the house, the Lutzes, uh, because it was not concealed in any way. The claim made in Chapter 11 of the book that the house was built on the site where the local uh, Shincock Indians once uh, abandoned their mentally ill and dying was rejected by the local Native American leaders. The claim of cloven hoof prints in the snow, January 1st, 1976, was also rejected by researchers uh, Rick Morin and Peter Jordan, uh, whose investigation revealed that there had been no snowfall at that time. Neighbors reported nothing uh, unusual during that time that the Lutzes were living there. Police officers are depicted visiting the house in the book and in the 1979 film, However, there are no records that show the Letzes called any police during this period while they were living in Ocean Avenue. There's also no bar in Amityville called the Witch's Brew at the time as well. Critics include Stephen Kaplan uh, have pointed out that the change was made in the book as it was reprinted in several editions. In the original hardcover edition, Father Precario's car was an old tan Ford and his experience in the incident uh, in which the hood flies up against the windshield while driving. In later editions, the car is described as a Chevy Vega and reverted before reverting to a Ford. In 1977, George and Kathy Letts filed a lawsuit against William Weber, the defense lawyer for the uh, Ronald Defoe Jr. at the time of his trial. Uh, Paul Hoffman, who was a writer working on the account of the hauntings, and Bernard Burton, and Frederick Mars, both alleged clairvoyants who had examined the house. Uh, along with Good Housekeeping Magazine, the New York Sunday News, and the Hearst Corporation. The Letzes allegedly misappropriation of names for trade purposes, evasion of privacy, and mental distress. The claims against the news corporations were dropped, and the remainder of the lawsuits were heard by Brooklyn U.S. District Court Judge Jack Weinstein. Now, in September 1979, Judge Weinstein dismissed the Lutz cases. And uh, September 17, 1979, issue of People magazine, it explained that William Weber wrote, quote, I know this book is a hoax. We created this horror story over many bottles of wine. This refers to the meeting that Weber is said to have had with George and Kathy Lutz, during which they discussed what would later become the outline for Anson's book. Judge Weinstein also expressed concern about the conduct of William Weber and Bernard Burton relating to this affair, stating, quote, There's a very serious ethical question when lawyers become literary agents. George Lutz maintained uh, the events of the book were mostly true throughout the rest of his life. In June 1979, George and Kathy both took a polygraph test re uh, relating their experiences at the house. The polygraph tests were performed by Chris 
Gugus and Michael Rice, who at the time were reportedly among the top five polygraph experts in America. The results in which Rice's opinion did not indicate that they were lying. In October 2000, the History Channel broadcast Amityville, The Haunting, and Amityville Horror or Hoax, a two-part documentary made by horror screenwriter Daniel Ferenz. The debate about the accuracy of the Amityville horror continues. Various owners of the house since the Letts family left in 1976 have publicly reported that there have never been any more problems while living there. James Cromarty, uh, also who bought the house in 77 and lived there with his wife Barbara for 10 years, commented, quote, Nothing weird ever happened, except for the people coming by because of the book and the movie. Now, the people and events fictionalized in the Amityville Horror have been the subject of many, many films. Uh, I actually counted them. There's over 20 films based on the Amityville case, uh, many of which share uh, zero to little connection uh, to the actual source material. Now, of course, everybody knows the 1979 film based on the Anson novel, which was best known in the series. Uh, James Brolin and Margaret Kidder portray the couple, George and Kathy Lutz. The first three Amityville films actually received theatrical releases, with the fourth being made for television by NBC, and all other sequels from the 90s were released direct to video, and again, contained virtually no material relating to the Lutz family themselves. Instead, they concentrate on paranormal phenomena caused by, quote, cursed items supposedly linked to the house. Now, one of the better-known features of the Amityville Horror series of films is the distinctive jack-o'-lantern-like appearance of the house, which was created by uh, two-quarter round windows on the third floor in the attic. Uh, the windows were actually illuminated in the films, giving the presence of menacing eyes. Now, the first three films were filmed in a house in Tom's River, New Jersey, which was converted to look like the uh, 112 Ocean Avenue after the Authorities in Amityville denied permission to film at that location. Although not all of the films in the Amityville horror series are actually set in the former Lutz house, the distinctive Dutch colonial house is traditionally used as the main image for any promotional material. In 2005, there was actually a remake of the original film with the tagline, Catch Him and Kill Him, referring to the claim link between the house and Ocean Avenue and John Ketchum whose name had been linked to witchcraft in Salem, Massachusetts, but remains a controversial and elusive figure. That version exaggerates the isolation depicted uh, being a remote house similar to the Overlook Hotel in Stephen King's Shining. Uh, but in reality, the 112 Ocean Avenue was a suburban house within 50 feet of other houses in the neighborhood. Uh, the house used in the 2000 film, uh, 2005 version was in Silver Lake, Wisconsin, uh, while other location work was actually shot in Illinois. Now, George Letts described the 2005 remake as drivel and sued the makers for breach of contract and defamation and libel. He objected particularly to the scene of the film where the male lead, named George Letts, was played by Ryan Reynolds, is shown killing the family dog with an axe. Now, the film also shows George Letts' character building coffins for the members of his own family. The defamation claim was dismissed by the Los Angeles court in 2005, while other issues related to the lawsuit remain unresolved at the time of George Letts' death. Now, the documentary My Amityville Horror was released in March 2013, which featured interviews with Daniel Letts, one of the children who lived in the house during the period of time in which the books and the films were based. Letts echoes the original story told by his mother and stepfather, he also makes additional claims that both he and George were possessed and that George demonstrated telekinetic abilities and strongly suggested that George's dabbling in the occult might have actually had initiated the demonic events. Now, a little bit of the legacy in terms of this story. Kathleen Lutz uh, unfortunately passed away in 2004, August of emphysema, and George Lutz died in May uh, 2006 of a heart disease. The couple had divorced actually in the late 80s, but they remained on good terms. 
Now, during the period of which the Lutz family was living at the uh, house on Ocean Avenue, Stephen Kaplan, a self-styled vampirologist and ghost hunter, was called in to investigate the house. Uh, Kaplan and the Lutzes uh, did have a falling out, and Kaplan said that he would have exposed any fraud if it was found. Kaplan went on to write a critical book titled Amityville Horror Conspiracy with his wife, Roxanne Kaplan. The book was published in 1995. On the night of March 6th, 1976, the house was investigated by Ed and Lorraine Warren, a husband and wife team self-described as demonologists, uh, together with a crew from uh, television station Channel 5 New York and reporter Michael Linder. Uh, during the course of that investigation, Gene Campbell took a series of infrared time-lapse photograph photographs, and uh, one of the images allegedly showed a demonic boy with glowing eyes who was standing in the foot of the staircase. The photograph didn't emerge to the public domain until 1979, when George and Kathy Lutz and Rod Stinger appeared on the Merv Griffin Show to promote the release of the first film. Ocean Avenue was investigated by paranormal psychologists Hans Holzer, and the Warrens and Holzer have suggested that the house occupied by malevolent spirits due to its history. The Warrens visited the house. Was, depiction, uh, was depicted in the film The Conjuring 2 that came out in 2016. Now, George Lutz registered the phrase the Amityville Horror as a trademark in 2002, and it's referred to as the Amityville Horror trademark on his website. Lutz claimed that the film producers embellished or even fabricated events portrayed in the film, both in the 1979 and 2005 remake. He claimed that the producers of the, particularly the 2005 film didn't involve his family at all, and they were just using his name without permission. The house is known as 112 Ocean Avenue, and it still exists till this day. It's been renovated, and the address has changed uh, to discourage sightseers from visiting the site. The quarter round windows have been removed, and the house today looks considerably different than the depictions in the film. The house is in Tom's River, used it for the location of the first three films, and also been modified for the same reasons. In 2005 film version, the house was changed to 412 Ocean Avenue, and it also says that the basement of the Letz's house was built in uh, 1692, but historians in my research said that in 112 Ocean Avenue, known as High Hopes, was only built around 1924 uh, by John and Catherine Moynihan. Local residents and authorities in Amityville, New York, are also unhappy with all the attention that the Amityville horror brings to their town, and tends to decline requests to discuss anything publicly. The website Amityville Historical Society makes no mention of the murders by Ronald Defoe Jr. in 1974 or any period of the Lutz family living in that house on Ocean Avenue. When the History Channel made its documentary about Amityville Horror in 2000, no member of the Historical Society would discuss the matter on camera. That in 2010, in May, the house was placed on the market with the asking price of $1.15 million. And on August 2010, the house was sold to a local resident for $950,000. And that August, uh, the departing owner had held a moving sale of the house, and hundreds of people turned up to the event. They were allowed to go inside the house. However, they were given specific instructions not to visit any of the upstairs room or enter the basement. I wonder why. Well, as quick as that was, I do hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Again, if you like tonight's episode, consider listening to my other ones or any other great podcasts by indie podcast creators on the Darkcast Network. Thank you for listening. My name is DJ, and this has been the Mythical True Crime Podcast. Good night.